Hi, my dragons. Okay, it's part three of Victim's Rights chapter, and I want to go over the cases that really have shaped uh, where we came from and where we are today in terms of the VIS, the Victim Impact Statements. And the first case that is presented in your book is Booth versus Maryland. And this was an interesting case where um, Booth was convicted of first degree murder in the deaths of two elderly, an elderly couple, um, and they were like 78 and 75. So he was um, rob robbing their house, and he, what he did was he tied up the couple, he gagged them, and then he stabbed them numerous times. Um, the jury found Booth guilty uh, of both killings, and then Booth's lawyer objected to the vis. Booth's lawyer said that it contained a lot of things that were inflammatory and it unduly biased uh, the jury. And one of the things was the daughter had to cancel her honeymoon. Um, she started talking about, she had to cancel the honeymoon because she was at the funeral. She said things like her parents were butchered like animals. Nobody should be treated like that. They were really kind and nice people um, that she didn't think she could ever get over their deaths and things like that. And um, then the lawyer, Booth's lawyer, said that this was very prejudicial to his client. It went up to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court was narrowly, uh, narrowly ruled five to four that um, the capital sentence should not have a this um, during deliberations because it will unduly influence um, the jury. Uh, so that was really interesting. And they said that it can't serve any other purpose but to inflame uh, the jury. And it would confuse them on what is someone's opinion versus the relative uh, evidence. Disagreeing with them in the dissenting opinion was uh, Justice Scalia, who said, and this was his direct quote, um, he said, the evidence of much human suffering the defendant has inflicted upon should not be oppressed uh, in an effort to prescribe a debate on what's appropriate and what's not. And he said that it seems to me that it's not even remotely unconstitutional to permit both the pros and the cons of the case to be presented to the jury. Um, so he was coming down in favor of the this because he thought of it as very important for a jury to consi consider. So then after that case, we had South Carolina versus uh, Gathers about this one man who was the victim. Na last name was Hayes. And he had a lot of psychological problems. He had been in, on, in and out of mental health uh, facilities for his whole life. He thought he was a preacher. He used to run around and pontificate and say all these Bible verses and things like that. And because um, he was very, uh, like an odd duck, this man named Gathers, uh, and he had a bunch of his friends, well, they beat um, Hayes and then stabbed him to death, okay? And the jury found Gathers guilty of first-degree murder and other charges as well. So during the sentencing phase, the prosecutor started to talk about the deceased. He was doing his own vis about the how he was a religious person and how uh, he was an upstanding person in the community. And the jurors voted to give the death penalty uh, to, to uh, Gathers. <clears throat> so... This was objected to because you sh they said, well, you can't deliver the death sentence just because the person is a religious man. So when it went to the South Carolina, I'm sorry, North Carolina Supreme Court, uh, they overturned it and said, OK, well, you can't do that because the sentence is inappropriate just because the victim happens to be uh, religious. So then it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said basically the same thing. You can't sit there and say they he doesn't deserve that just because of it, the person is religious okay so this brings up something interesting here you have the prosecutor prosecutor uh, arguing or doing the this 
So what happens, you wonder, what, when someone doesn't have survivors or who's going to argue on behalf of the victim uh, when they're alone? You know, and what happens to someone who dies and they're not religious or they're not a good person? I mean, dead is dead. <laughs> you don't deserve to die if you're good or if you're bad, right, at the hands of someone else. So that was an interesting sort of uh the thing as well. But in that case, you had Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Scalia uh, arguing again, saying that the jury should be able to consider all of these things. So in both, in that case, you had two Supreme Court justices echoing the same thing. And they both said later on that if they were going to revisit these cases, they would overturn them. Okay. So that was really interesting that it was sort of stuck there for a while. And then along comes Payne versus Tennessee two years later. And this was a, a case where the Supreme Court reversed itself, okay? So Payne is a guy, and he has this girlfriend who I guess is cheating on him. He's like a window monitor, and he's watching her apartment, and she's always gone. So he decides he's going to break into her apartment and confront her. So he confronts her, and then he demands sex, which she refuses. And so he says, oh, yeah, well... <laughs> I'll just stab you to death. And he stabs her 84 times. Also present was her two-year-old and her three-year-old, and he slits the throat of the two-year-old, killing the two-year-old, and he stabs the three-year-old with the intention uh, of killing the three-year-old. His name was Nick, three years old. He left him for dead. Well, by some miracle, Nick didn't die, and uh, he survived, okay? So during the sentencing, the grandmother uh, did a this. Okay, so the grandmother goes and she does a vis and she says things like, Nicholas is facing a lot of duress. He cries for his mom. He doesn't understand why she's not home. She's not there. Nicholas's uh, mom will never be able to kiss him goodnight or pat, pat him as he goes off to bed or hold him and sing a lullaby and all of these things. And um, he'll never be able to get over it. He cries all the time and it's an atrocity. So the jury uh, imposed a death penalty on Payne, and Payne's lawyer appealed the sentence, saying that any reliance on the this uh, is prejudicial, and it should follow Booth and Gathers because that's at the stage. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. They appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court um, granted Sosheri, which means that they will hear the case. And the Supreme Court, at that point, overturned the conviction, overturned the um, earlier rulings, okay? So first, the jury said death. On appeal, they said, hey, it fits with the last two cases. So the appeals court said, yes, you're right, it fits with the last two cases. So we, and we're we getting rid of the death sentences. And then it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed to hear it. And the Supreme Court said, no, uh, you're gonna, we're going to impose the death penalty, okay? Again... The reason they did that is the Supreme Court said the state legitimately had evidence about the victim that was relevant to the jury's decision, and there's no reason not to include that. So as a result of pain, the courts don't can't suppress a vis anymore. They can't, in a capital case especially, um, to protect rights for the defense, okay, for the defendant. Uh, the, it is appropriate for the jury to hear, and there's nothing in the Eighth Amendment that forbids that testimony according to the Constitution. So that was a reversal of the cases that were before it. Then in 2008, we had Kelly versus uh, California. Kelly was sentenced to death for the murder of a 19-year-old, and the prosecutor played this video. So the this was a video, which is another question. Can we, can we put videos and sentimental videos in? And the video was about the victim, her childhood. It started in childhood, talked about her whole life, and uh, all of these kind of nice things. It had music in it and everything. And um, so they played the, vic the video, and the jury said death penalty. Well, the defense appealed and said it was inflammatory and prejudicial, and they appealed to the Supreme Court again, requesting a certiorari, so that requesting that the Supreme Court would hear it, and the Supreme Court said, nope, we're not going to hear it, because we ruled in uh, the last case. So it stands today that you can hear the vis. So I guess the interesting thing is, by not hearing the vis in Kelly case, I guess it's okay to, um, you know, have videos and sentimental videos. 
So that's one of the questions that's left. So now we're kind of sitting here in 2008. So the last big ruling was Kelly versus California in 2008. We're left with that decision that the Supreme Court considers this settled law. And I guess videos are okay as well. Here's some of the questions that um, it leaves. Um, the victim ha has a uh, impact on the survivor, these are the components. What is the impact of the crime and what is the opinion about the sentence, sentencing guidelines? So here's some of the questions. Can it just be the immediate family? Can it be the prosecutor as we saw in the case before that? What goes? What's able to go? So the Supreme Court didn't hear uh, the case in Kelly, so I guess videos are okay. Well, what about love poems and photographs and music and all of that kind of things? Should the judges allow expert testimony about um, the this? What kind of instructions should the judge give the jury? Should the defense be able to uh, rebut this this, uh, especially if it has hearsay evidence or inflammatory evidence? What if we only the judge heard it? Would that be fair? Does the victim have a right to be heard and to have a this in front of a jury or just a judge? So there are statistical differences in cases in terms of outcome when a judge hears the case versus a jury. And Calvin and Zeisel did a great job in their really comprehensive research about judges and juries' decision. You'll get into that more in Psychology of Law. Um, and then what is the what is the sentencing and the purpose of a vis to begin with? Is the verse the same the vis the same? Should it have the same impact as evidence, trial evidence? Um, so some states have made these guidelines for jurors and says and say things like, no, it's not the same as evidence. It doesn't relieve the burden of reasonable doubt or any of those decision making capacities. It shouldn't substitute as evidence for proof. It's just someone's um, feelings and telling the effect of what happened. In Florida, the purpose is to um, uh, talk about the victim and the individuals, what the individual was like, not to slam the defense. They're very, they, they put a big hold on that. So different states are writing in what they think is appropriate in the this and what is not. So the, the interesting thing that will develop in time is where, when will the Supreme Court hear a new this case that really challenges pain, right? Or was it gathers? Well, the one that they said was, yes, they has the right to have a this. When will the Supreme Court hear that case? And what will be included in that that is begging those questions to be answered? Like what, what can be included in the this and what can't be included in the this? So those are very interesting. So right now, the, the Supreme Court considers it settled law. Um, and I would think that a lot of and a lot of states have written their own um, opinions as to what should and shouldn't go in the business. I would think that those things are going to be challenged, especially when it comes to technological advances. Can you imagine if the victim, they did like a hologram of the victim and the victim is actually talking to the jury? That all of those things are possible by today's technology. The thing is, will that be used someday? And then will the Supreme Court step up and say, okay, that's not that's not allowed, but this is allowed. So we're going to wait to see what happens with that. And I think the technology will really uh, push that and some attorney's willingness to be gutsy enough to take that into court and say, well, the Supreme Court said we could use <laughs> anything. So let's see what happens. So that is um, a, a to be continued sort of legal question. But in the interim, it's quite interesting. And I'll, I'll be doing some research on that uh, next year because I find it fascinating. Especially given the Supreme Court's silence since 2008. That's a long time that they've been silent on this. So what has happened to victim advocacy and victims after all of this? Well, there has been a movement. Like back in the day when there was a movement to professionalize law enforcement, there's also been a movement to professionalize victim advocacy. And if this were a seated class, we would have given you the initial certification of victim for victims advocate. So when we return to Tiffin University, if you still want to do that, please contact me and I will make arrangements for you to get that certification. Uh, it's just the very first part of the certification, but it's still something cool to put on your resume. So do take advantage of that. Give me a call and we'll work on that for you. So you won't miss out on that. Even if you're a senior and you're going to graduate, you can always just 
contact me and we'll we'll get you into that get you get that certification for you um so they professionalize this we have a national victims um academy just like the fbi has uh, their fbi academy and corrections has the corrections academies and then every state has their own office of victim services and i'm going to put that website up there for you and they have their own um mandated certifications which mirror what goes on at the federal level so um, that's what I was saying that we would do that so the NVAA which I have the whole curriculum if anybody wants to see it or have it I can send it to you and you'll have it um, so we have all that for the state of Ohio and you can I'll put that um, victims thing up there it's under the state of Ohio Attorney General they're the ones that run it and actually one of the directors is a Tiffin University Dragon alum go Dragons anyway and if you ever want to do an internship with her or connect with her we can um, definitely put that in motion for you so keep that in the back of your head if this is turning you on <laughs> so anyway um, so they have a three-part certification, NVAA has a three-part certification. The first one is entry level. The second one is for people already working in their field and they just need more direction. And the third one is for people who want to administer, be an administrator or a manager at a uh, victim service um, uh, organization from state to state. And that's very helpful. And the attorney general, as I said, attorney general's office, this is usually where it's located throughout the country. They have their own state-mandated um, victim services thing that they're doing so it is a big big step forward to what it was in the past and what it's showing is a growing recognition of um, the need to have quality services uniform services throughout the United States for victims who need help to really move the whole field the criminal justice field toward a more fair and just victim oriented still the criminal justice system but more victim oriented or victim aware than it has been historically so that's where we are right now and that's the summary of the chapter i hope you enjoyed it as much as i do i really do enjoy learning how we've advanced and changed uh, to encompass more um, advocacy for victim rights it's very cool so next week um we're going to start on restorative justice which I really enjoy and that is more the model that we see around the world and we'll get into that um, next week so stay strong dragons stay healthy make sure you're practicing safe social distancing and remember we got this we're dragons we're tough and it's a great day to be a dragon miss you guys <laughs>